Hello everyone, welcome to Show of Hands. Um, my name is Bobby. I'm a member of the Black Cultural Archives Youth Forum. Uh, the Black Cultural Archives is in Brixton and it's an institution which seeks to preserve the heritage of African and Caribbean um, people and teach people about the history of those people living in this country. This is Nishi. <laughs> I'm Nishi, I'm from the Recreative Editorial Board. We're based here in South London Gallery. Um, so it's Recreative UK is an online um, platform encouraging young people to get involved with contemporary art. And it's just a platform so we can um, share our work with each other and share different opportunities available. Um, so yeah, that's what I do. Okay, so welcome to a Vote of Confidence. Um, this is the concluding panel event of the Show of Hands weekend, um, which was initiated by the South London Gallery in collaboration with Arcadia Missa, the Black Culture Archives, CGP London, Camberwell College of Arts, Hannah Barry Gallery and Peckham Platform. Um, so this week we've had some amazing events, including a poetry evening, um, there was a David Cameron impersonator wandering the streets of Peckham, um, being in everyone's Twitter feed. Um, and the focus of today's panel, um, which is again titled Vote of Confidence, is about young people's relationship with politics. Um, in the last election, only 44% of young people voted, um, and 42% um, in this day and age, well, today, <laughs> not in this day and age, of 16 to 24 year olds have no interest in politics at all. Um, sections of society blame this on youth apathy, um, we're the millennials who are obsessed with selfies and ourselves. Um, and we're uninterested in politics according to the media. But this is a lazy narrative and hopefully this panel will be challenging that today. Whilst young people aren't necessarily interested in the politics of Westminster, um, a lot of them are actively engaged in non-traditional methods of politics. So a lot of people take part in boycotts, protests, um, lots of people have free Palestine badges. Um, and my Facebook feed is always filled with change.org petitions. I don't know if any of you have ever shared one. Um, the recent rise of the popularity of Russell Brand is a clear example that young people are looking for someone who speaks their language, who can voice their opinions, and they're not getting that at the moment with mainstream politics. Um, so why aren't young people voting? Is it the electoral system that's preventing them? Our panelists will surely have many thoughts on the issues. So just quickly to explain the layout of this event is we're going to do introductions and we're going to spend about 20 minutes asking you questions and then we're going to open up to the audience to ask questions, yeah? Um, so our panel, we have Shay Akiwawa, who was the youngest councillor in Newham in 2014. Um, we've got Esma Beshkom from Bite the Ballot a politically neutral um, organisation to encourage young voters. Um, we've got Katie Gosh from the Electoral Reform Society. Um, we've got Morgan Quintus, um, who's a London-based writer, musician, broadcaster and curator. And then we've got Dash and Zem, who are artists, um, who's been working with the South London Gallery Art Assassins, so the whole David Cameron look-alike in Peckham thing. Um, so what I want now is if I can get you guys to introduce yourself and what you do for five minutes and um, just tell us about the first time you voted or the first time you kind of got engaged with politics. So Shay. Um, so yes, my name is Shay Akiwowo. I was locally elected to the London Borough of Newham, which is in East London. I've been up to explain my relationship with politics in my opening speech and actually found this question quite hard to answer. Um, for me, politics is about working with different tools and mechanisms to better all of society. So on one hand, there's my formal engagement with politics, what I defined as systematic politics. I had to Google this to make sure it was a word. Does anyone do that? Like, make sure you, miss, you, you use Google to spell a word. I'm just not sure how it's going. So yeah. Um, so under systematic politics, uh, before being elected, I was working in Brussels for the European Youth Forum as a youth policy and monitoring and communications officer. So in this role, I was able to lobby members of the European Parliament on youth issues such as youth unemployment, um, informal education, and increasing participation in democracy. 
as an ex-youth parliamentarian and a youth councillor in my teens, I developed a real passion for youth rights and addressing social inequalities as an activist, but in more of the systems. I then started getting involved in my local party. As a women's officer, I've been able to increase young female engagement in party politics, raise a lot of local women issues, such as domestic violence to the council, and have raised funds for charities, such as Bring Back Our Girls. My role as a, currently as a councillor involves a lot of various things, reforming, improving the system, and more recently, protecting aspects of the system because of budget cuts. I answer to and advocate on behalf of my residents, and my residents have loads of different needs. Um, I live in what's become more of a gentrified ward in, in Borough, so I've got one aspect where I, where I used to live, where it's the African community who are really trying um, hard to work hard to make ends meet. Then I have more of the community uh, that's kind of moving over from Hackney, who couldn't afford to live in Hack Hack um, Hackney any longer, who are asking for more greenery and parks and yoga. So I'm having to deal with <laughs> um, both sides of the, of the spectrum. Uh, I had one resident complain to me about Japanese knotweed. I didn't even know what Japanese knotweed was, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, um, so I have to answer to and advocate on behalf of my residents, and I also have to work with colleagues to bring about systematic change. And these methods, systematic change, has a lot of, has a lot of advantages, but has some drawbacks as well, and I'm happy to discuss that. Sure. Uh, on the other hand, there's the activist in me, which is a really cool and more dignified of way of saying I've got an opinion and a big mouth, and I like to <laughs> highlight some of, the, some of the significant inequalities affecting community groups. I speak, and by speak I mean literally speak at opportunities like this, um, tweet, blog, write, on race inequality, sexism, and the fusion of the two under intersectionality. Um, particularly as a young woman of colour, I feel that the voice, this voice is very quiet on this side of the pond, and so it's necessary to discuss and challenge this. I mobilise and encourage young people to take part in democracy in whatever form suits them. I just want them to be active, so whether this is work shadowing me for a day and finding out I'm really boring or I'm really busy, up to them. Whether it's, talking about, whether it's talking to them about the importance of voting or just reg being registered to vote, or it's encouraging young people to talk to their representative, um, talk to their councillors, their MPs, their MEPs. I've been able to speak in various media outlets as well, including The Guardian as, a life, as my life as a young female who is black and a politician. 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, a politician and how we can encourage more diversity in politics. So to answer your final question, um, my first experience of voting was with my mum. We basically lived adjacent to the local community centre, and so our family and our street had no excuse not to vote. So I remember going along with my mum when she went to go and vote, and then with my sister, so it just became a habitual thing, and I, in 2010 it was my turn to vote. Um, Esma, um, can you tell us a bit about yourself, bite the ballot and your first time voting or politics? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Esma, I'm here representing Bite the Ballot today. We're a youth democracy organisation. Um, we do so much work with young people aged 16 to 24 and we just want them to, to really engage in politics. Um, so when people turn around and say things like young people are apathetic and they don't care about politics, I just turn around and think, what? Because it's not true. I think, I think the rhetoric needs to change around that. Um, but, but yeah, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that later on. Um, I work as a community engagement officer, so I go around schools and colleges and youth organisations, um, and I deliver sessions called The Basics, which you can find on our website. Um, and I register as many um, 16 to 24 year olds as, as possible. Um, working with Bite the Ballot, um, we've orchestrated National Voters Registration Day, which actually ran for a week at the beginning of February. And collectively, um, in the country, we managed to register almost 500,000 people in that one week, which is quite incredible. Um, we recently held Democracy Day, uh, which was on the 15th of April, and this was where um, myself and the other community engagement officers held events across local schools and universities. Um, and again, just that final push for the 20th of April deadline, the registration deadline. Um, and it was, though it wasn't necessarily all, all us, um, but the, on the 20th of April itself, um, 
again, almost half a million people were registered. So it's, it's just amazing to see um, what can happen when we all get together and work collectively. Um, so yeah, um, and with regards to my first voting experience, um, I'm gonna really throw it back now. Um, I'm gonna take you back to year seven, um, which is when I first voted for a kind of election in the classroom. Um, and the reason why I'm telling you about this is because of the way that it made me feel, and I think it's always really important. Um, and you tend to always remember things that make you feel a type of way. Um, so basically, you know, we had um, class reps um, in a school council kind of setting, and um, I, you know, put my vote forward and in the same way that you would with the traditional voting system. And um, it turned out that the person that I voted for actually ended up representing my class. Um, and it, it made me feel quite empowered that my me expressing my choice um, kind of ended up in a result that I was quite happy with. Um, and I think that's why it's really important for everybody, not just young people, to get out and express their vote. I mean, but yeah, but my first time voting was a local election, um, and that was for a <coughs> councillor election. And to be honest, I can't remember who I voted for, um, though I can't really say anyway. But, um, but yeah, I can't really remember. I don't, I wasn't really 100% engaged. I just knew that in order to, to kind of be a proactive citizen, it was an important thing to do, but I didn't really understand the logic behind it, I just did it because my parents voted and I thought it was something that should be done really. Um, but yeah, I think as you kind of grow older maybe, or as I grow older rather, um, I kind of realised why it's important to kind of figure things out for yourself and um, kind of develop your political interests and do a lot of research before you turn up on polling day. Great, thank you. Um, Katie? Great. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. It's fantastic to be here, although I'm disappointed to have missed the David Cameron impersonator. <laughs> that sounds really, really fun. Um, Bite the Ballad do fantastic work. My organisation, Electoral Reform Society, has been kind of in conversation with Bite the Ballot since the beginning. And I had the privilege of being at your conference last year, which was fantastic, and kind of experienced the basics, this really great practical session you do in schools. And I'm always talking about it. And if any of you are kind of connected with schools and could kind of work with Bite the Ballot to make sure we get those sessions out to as many people as possible. Because it, it's such a simple way to say that when people are given the opportunity to kind of chew over politics, and I know you do a thing where you get people to kind of write the budget for the country in quite simple terms, <coughs> kind of having that power in your hands and then registering people, I think is a very powerful thing. So um, I'm just going to time myself so I don't go over. <laughs> uh, the, I guess, I, I mean, I love the idea that we're actually talking about our relationship to politics because that's something we probably... Uh, don't don't talk about enough. So for me, I, I, I feel like I was sort of born with a kind of raging sense of injustice about things in the world. So for me, politics wasn't a separate thing. It was part of who I was. And I remember when I was 10 or 11, I took on my teacher because I couldn't understand why women changed their names when they got married. It just it was sort of beyond me, really. Um, so and my teacher was being sort of devil's advocate and was arguing why we should. And the whole class ganged up against me and argued that, well, of course, you know, women should change their names. And I, I've never forgotten, really. I guess it was kind of an early political experience of being in a minority of one against a class of 29. But it was just something I felt strongly about. Um, my kind of other experiences of politics were very local and I think this is something that's important to reflect on because many more people feel connected with their street, their neighbourhood, what's going on around them. When people often say, oh, I'm not interested in politics or what is politics, they'll say actually this is going on in my park, my local hospital, around the corner. And I think if we can start local we might have more of a chance of knitting people in politics back together again. And I lived in a fairly rural area and a road was going to be built across, it was on the South Downs and my mum just kind of never done anything like that before but she got a sort of action group together locally, she just sort of put up a sign and lots of people came to the 
community centre and I suppose I had that experience just of a kind of common cause really. There was a man who was passionate about bird life who didn't want the road to be built and then there were lots and lots of other people who didn't care very much about birds but they had other reasons for the countryside not to be built on. So those are just some of my sort of early experiences of politics and unsurprisingly I can remember them far more clearly than I can my first experience of voting one of the reasons that the Electoral Reform Society where why we're passionately campaigning to have the franchise extended to 16 and 17 year olds is that if you have it at 18, in my case I then actually didn't vote, well I missed voting when I was 22, I was out of the country, I didn't organise myself, so I didn't really vote till my mid-twenties and I think the great benefit of having earlier, younger voting is that you can have a kind of seamless political education that should start age five, obligation on schools, something that like the ballot's been campaigning for, to register young people at 16, have that early experience. We have five-year fixed-term parliaments now, you might have to wait five years anyway. So I, I just sort of feel there's lots of practical reasons, um, as well as the passion behind it as to why, why we should have earlier voting. And I guess, you know, I was a very kind of political person and yet I didn't, you know, happen to be abroad, didn't get my act together. Um, so I suppose that, that there's, there's something there. 30 seconds. Yeah. Can you need to just explain what the electoral... Sure, yeah, I was going to come on to that, yeah. So, um, my, for me, politics is really about the kind of quieter voices in society and making sure that we hear from them as well as the people with the, the ability to shout loudest. And that's been something that's gone throughout my working life. So I started off representing refugees as a lawyer, people with shamefully very quiet voices who, who weren't really heard. Um, I then ran a human rights charity called the British Institute of Human Rights and now I run the Electoral Reform Society which is the country's leading campaign for campaigning for a modern democracy. We've got a passion for politics, we think that many aspects of our democracy are back in the 19th century, let alone the 20th. So we're really campaigning for 21st century democracy. There are 14 of us, I have two colleagues in Scotland, two in Wales and the rest of us, nine or ten of us are in London and we campaign for electoral reform, so a fairer way to choose our elected representatives which would mean that everybody would have a voice and that you would see your choices reflected in Parliament, so if you vote for Green or UKIP or Labour or Lib Dems or the Conservatives, whoever you vote for, those votes would be counted up in a fair way and you'd see that translated into seats and elected representatives in our Parliament. Um, and, yeah. <laughs> we'll come back. Um, yes. The yeah, that's great. Um, so, yeah, lo lots more to go on to, but I'm just going to wrap up there. Thank you. Um, Morgan. Cool. All right. Uh, my name's Morgan Quaintance. I'm a writer, musician, curator, and broadcaster. Uh, primarily, everything that I do revolves around talking about, mediating, and explaining contemporary art to people in different um, different registers. So it could be for an amateur audience, it could be for a student audience, or it could be for an audience of art historians. Um, so my first voting experience. Uh, well, I think my first voting experience was in the last mayoral elections which I feel a bit ashamed to say because I'm sitting on this panel, we're gonna be talking about voting today. So I was a bit when they invited me to come, I was like, you sure you got the right person? Um, but to echo what Katie was saying, it doesn't necessarily mean I haven't been politically engaged. Uh, I think from uh, an early age, well, from about eight or nine, I can remember taking oppositional stance to apartheid in South Africa, making sure that I didn't buy certain fruits, not with my, you know, my pocket money or when I was shopping with my mum, but also that instead of into my teenage years, because I think, from an early age, I've always been part of what I still like to call counterculture. What I mean by that is that I position myself, my values, my cultural values, social values, social values, sorry, um, uh, against uh, the dominant norms, against convention, against the commercial, uh, commercial sort of imperative that's driving a lot of culture today. So I always positioned myself in opposition to sort of normative culture or normative ideas of gender, sexuality, race, and class. Um, so when I was young, that meant I was aligned with uh, organisations like the Anti-Nazi League, um, anti-racism uh, movements, and also uh, with New Age Travellers. I don't know if you remember those uh, people who were operating in the early 90s, but um, I was obviously on the alter alternative music scene, involved in punk and sort of grunge and stuff. So that meant necessarily that you were aligned with New Age Travellers and would find yourself... Um, I guess, on demonstrations to uh, stop the extension of some 
highway or stop some trees being cut down or whatever. So um, right from then through to what I'm doing now, I've always been... Um, I've, another way of putting it is that politics for me isn't just about real politics. It isn't just about who's in um, the House of Parliament. It's also to do with power, who wields power and how they wield it and who is disenfranchised by the people in power and the, and the sort of um, practices and procedures that they enact by having that power. Um, so one of the ways that that works, plays itself out in my work as a critic, say, is that um, I'll be looking at the way institutions behave and the way institutions position people who work within them. So it could mean that if an institution <coughs> has uh, a programmatic bias towards a specific uh, gender or a specific race, then it's my position to question that. Um, but not necessarily lobbying for a specific group, it's lobbying just in general for... Um, greater inclusivity, uh, greater egalitarianism, uh, um, greater opportunities for everybody. Um, I do believe that contemporary art is for everyone, but it doesn't mean that I think it should sacrifice complexity to be that. Rather, I think that everybody is capable of thinking in a complex way and that we should help to facilitate them to do that. And that's why I think galleries are fantastic. I've sort of gone off on a tangent a bit there, but I, I think what I'm sort of saying is that I feel like my work is about politics in the sense that it's to do with um, allowing people to have a greater um, awareness of themselves and awareness of their possibilities within the world and not necessarily to grow up and be born into uh, castes or moulds in which they, their sort of life plan is, is mapped out for them. I think that's what I'm talking about in being opposition to, uh, there's a sort of fancy term, heteronormativity. It's the idea that... Um, What's normal in the world is heterosexuality, uh, is sort of the, uh, I guess, middle class values and all the sort of aspirations and ideas of ownership that go with that. Um, yeah, so, um, yes, I think voting is really, really important, although I came quite slow to it. I think b because I was focused on issues that, I, it's hard to say actually. I think one of the reasons is just is, is just practical. Like I wasn't in the country. I used to be a musician. I was touring quite a lot, so it meant that I was out of the country or I was moving. I hadn't reg reg registered to vote. Um, so th I think part of it is practical, and part of it is also feeling just sort of like people didn't really represent what I felt was right. Um, thirty seconds. Yeah, thirty seconds. <laughs> um, so yeah, maybe we can unpack this, that stuff a bit more when we're having questions and answers. Uh, but yeah, that's me and that's uh, my first experience of voting. Thank you. Um, I think what you just said was really important, like, and the kind of message we're trying to say is yeah. even though we don't vote in general elections, it doesn't mean that we're not political in yeah. other things. Yeah. And you just explained it. Um, Dash and Dem, same thing. Explain a bit about yourselves, what you do, and your first experience being political or voting. Hi, so I'm Dash McDonald. Um, I suppose my route into politics was through design. Me and Demetrius started um, collaborating while we were students at the Royal College of Art on a design products MA. And initially, we were kind of both looking at social experiments and um, things like the Milgram or Stanford's prison experiment that would kind of show how behaviour could be affected by a kind of specific design system within larger kind of political institutions. From that we started to gain a real interest in actually kind of public engagement and kind of learning about the kind of role of design within kind of politics, whether that's a kind of political system, a kind of communication format. Um, we're specifically interested in this, this kind of notion of edutainment, so kind of communication formats that are designed to kind of entertain and educate at the same time, whether you're talking about reality TV, The Archers, Aesop's Fables. I mean, it's something that's always had a kind of really rich history and a, a kind of a very wide political significance. Um, so that kind of takes us into what we've been doing here with the Art Assassins, which is very much about the kind of mix of our interest in kind of political systems and entertainment. So for this project, we work with the David Cameron lookalike, uh, Brentley Browning, and the lookalike became the kind of educational catalyst to engage the Art Assassins, which is the South London Gallery's youth forum with political process and representation. Um, so within the process of that project, we started by kind of covering the rules of this space here with the current election pledges and kind of asking these long, young people 
what any of these really meant to them. Do they have any significance? What are they dream that kind of politicians would be promising and achieving for them? We then got them to perform their own kind of fantasy election pledges uh, with David Cameron last, so to kind of instantly make it a kind of performative, active kind of task. And that fed into them kind of creating their own pledge card. I mean, I don't know if any of you have seen the kind of Labour pledge card that they seem to use the same format kind of election after election, but they created their own five-point pledge card, which we then kind of took those kind of key pledges and inserted them into initially a, a 2014 conference speech by David Cameron that was all about a kind of Britain that we'd feel proud of. And the first time the Art Assassins met um, Bentley, he was standing here at a podium and kind of delivered this conference speech, but with all of their issues that they felt passionate inserted into. So that became then a catalyst to kind of talk about and engage with different aspects of political representation. So we looked at the notion of a, a kind of a soundbite and discussed how kind of political speeches are kind of engineered to kind of be effectively reported through soundbites. We then work with the art assassins to create their own kind of script of sound bites. I think, Dem, you've got a couple. Yes, I'll read uh, an extract from uh, the long speech. Uh, so here's one paragraph from that. I will speak out against the politics of hate, and if Nigel Farage disagrees, I will fight him from the steps of Downing Street to the chicken shops of Peckham. <laughs> We then looked at kind of constructed images and photo ops and how if you look at a lot of the sound bites, it's a very specific location. It could be kind of Nick Clegg talking about the importance of new homes in front of a building site with a hard hat. Um, so we kind of really dissected and kind of looked a lot of this kind of photo op politics with the art assassins and then they constructed a series of different kind of images that kind of linked with the different sound bites. Um, which were then kind of performed and documented and are kind of being developed towards, uh, for Thursday, their own kind of party political broadcast. Um, so, yeah, it's very much about kind of how do you use a kind of entertaining and engaging system to engage young people with politics, which very much in this case was the lookalike as a kind of piece of entertainment. Um, do we have much time? You have, like, 30 seconds left. <laughs> but... Yeah, I suppose um, the, the, the kind of work that we do does stem along looking at the complexities of different systems that can have an impact on our behaviour, be it in a big way or a small way. So as Dash just said, we tend to break down these systems and develop methods, be it uh, workshops, exercise books, where we can engage with different types of community groups or people or schools uh, in order to produce a workshop where this, uh, these methods become uh, gain a novel understanding about how these methods work, but also empower the individual as well to understand how these systems work and be able to act within society in a real way. So this particular one, which is to do with uh, political rhetoric, not only looks at the structure of rhetoric, but also the various gestures of how you can deliver an effective speech. Uh, and you know, it's teaching seven-year-olds the, this art as a way in which they can understand it, but also in their own life incorporate that and become effective. I think, um, so, sorry. No, I was just going to say, the, the most interesting, this, imagine being a world leader, which is this kind of role-play exercise teaching primary school children presentation. It's like we did it twice initially at a school in Stoke Newington, and coming to the second workshop, and at the time it was... Um, Tony Blair was Prime Minister and they were saying, oh, we've, you know, we've heard this talk from Tony Blair and we recognise the contrast or repetition and a rhetorical question. So again, it's like what Demetra is saying, it's about this kind of empowering through learning about political mechanisms. And it led us into our next question, basically. From the discussion, literally you've taken the question out of my mouth, like you've covered it. But I'm going to um, ask you to expand. So the, my first question is about language. Um, the language of day-to-day -day politics is conducted and can be a barrier to many people's participation. Um, you may be passionate about an issue, but when you watch a debate on that issue, you go like, what, what are these people talking about? Like, are we on the same page? Um, so my question is, what do you think politics can learn from art? Something like um, Dash and Dem's Bedford Voices project got really to the heart of issues that people were facing and um, it, was very, it was very accessible to everyone. And it's like, um, what, what, um, what, sorry, I've forgotten your name. 
Um, oh, me, Morgan. Yeah. Morgan, sorry. <laughs> um, what Morgan was saying about art, the fact that it doesn't have to sacrifice complexity, mm. and it's the job of people like critics to allow people to think in complex ways. So what, how can politics be doing that? Like, how can it make itself more? I think it's more to do with what we can learn from politics yeah. uh, rather than what politics can learn from us. I think becoming more aware of these very sophisticated, complex ways in which ideas are delivered and to be um, believed um, or understood or um, em empowering the masses to react is an area which, um, deliberately or non-deliberately, uh, we, we um, are kind of compelled to either want to engage with that or not. I think that we need to get on board with these methods and understand them more uh, and find a way that we can jump on that and be able to have our own views and voices within that way because they are very effective. effective. They engage millions of people uh, and it, it's not just about saying how you want to say it in your own way but how can you how can your voice become very powerful so with regards to Bedford Voices um, the the billboards we became very interested in the political poster and how it's put together and so we looked at previous political campaigns very carefully and worked with McGarry Bowen who is um, uh, an advertising agency in London and asked them lots of questions about the delivery of um, uh, certain words and imagery that can have that instant impact. And we put all these together in workshops where we delivered that and worked with the communities to get their clear message out. And um, over that time, gradually, they became more their views, which, which were starting off with we would like more of this, more of that. We, we began to work with them as to how to make them more powerful to engage a wider audience. And it was an experience for them that um, when they saw the billboard, it did become something that opened up a new uh, beginning for them as community groups to understand more about how they can get their voice across and their own views in a more effective way. I mean, it's quite interesting if you look at um, the student movements that have kind of sprang up, um, well, kind of globally in the last five years. I mean, if you take something like the student movement in Chile that kind of saw two of the, the kind of pr protagonists actually becoming kind of members of, of kind of parliament, a lot of these movements have drawn from marketing techniques. So within the student movement in Chile, they were kind of using very specific words and repeating them again and again to kind of make a wider population kind of have empathy and kind of see the significance of, of what they were trying to put across. They also broke down what they wanted as a group into like four very key points. So again, they're kind of being, there's this kind of marketing approach. There was a symbol, a kind of branding, a kind of use of social media in a kind of very creative and kind of playful ways, things like using a, a thriller tutorial to kind of train all of the activists to kind of deliver a kind of dance as a form of kind of non-violent sort of resistance. So again, there's like, uh, I think the success of a lot of these student movements outside of the UK have been also kind of connected to them adopting a kind of more, I mean, it sounds kind of awful, but a kind of more kind of marketing yeah. approach to their kind of campaigns as well. So there's, for me, there's kind of, a difficult line between the kind of political and the countercultural in terms of how you use these techniques. Does anyone else have any thoughts on that question? Yeah, can I dive in? Yeah, it's a really fascinating session. So what can politics learn from art? I mean, I think a lot, but, but touching on the point that's just been made, there's been a kind of professionalisation in our society over the last few decades, and I think politics has become professionalised, and some of that is, is probably good because it's about people trying to do things properly and efficiently and intelligently and well but some of it sadly has gone too far and we have had this soundbite culture and some of the research tells us that that is the thing that people hate most about politics that they feel that politicians have literally got somebody in their ear which they have they've got their briefing they've been told to say the same thing again and again and again 
but yet fascinating though that, that grassroots movements are also <laughs> adopting that yeah. because there is something quite key. I mean, since humans have been around, we've told each other stories in really simple ways because that is the way for it to go in. So I, I don't know, I, I think we're on, on a cusp of a, a new wave of politics now where a, there's a lot more independent-minded politicians actually who aren't just towing the party line and aren't just saying what they've kind of been told to say. And they're kind of responding to the public in that because people are saying, sorry, we're not, we're not interested in that, one of the reasons why we're not going, going to the polls. So I think that would be my sort of reflection. And in terms of what politics can learn, learn from art, therefore, I guess it's the, some of the kind of experimentalism you see in, in art and, and culture, almost by def definition, ground up movements, almost like a blank sheet of paper approach, whereas politics, established party politics, tends to be quite tired and safely doing the same things again and again and again and I guess that might be something you could learn from art would be a kind of to, to breathe fresh life and and just to have more visual images are, are we, is, is, is political art just going to be posters with people's names on or is there room for anything more exciting than that um, I'd like to is it is that a case if I yeah. but basically I think um, it's maybe quite important to qualify what we mean when we're talking about art because art has a lot of different um, the definitions according to who is talking about art, but one of the, one of the well, contemporary art in the art world is about criticality. It's about looking at a system and deconstructing it. It's no, since, say, let's say since the 1960s, it's no longer about the externalisation of an interior view. It's more about looking at the world, looking at how society is working, and trying to see if your artwork can position itself within some discussion about how some system is working. So, what is really interesting about what you guys did is that. You brought that criticality, the critical awareness that contemporary art operates in as a sort of fundamental principle. You brought that awareness to young kids who were able to say, oh, that was a rhetorical question. Now, the, the thing is, it's like, it's interesting. I wonder if politics would actually want to do that because it's basically about making young people as critically aware as contemporary artists from a young age. To understand that we don't necessarily live in a world where things occur naturally and that there is some natural order to things. But actually, we live in a world that's highly manipulated, and um, all the things that appear to us as being normal, or, or uh, again, the natural order of things, actually aren't necessarily so, and have been almost man-made. So that you're in a position to pull apart those things and question them. It seems to me that's the one way that you're going to have actual democracy, as opposed to this illusion of democracy that we have at the moment. Because what you have as democracy at the moment is the, the, the idea is that democracy is everyone has to say, everyone has to vote, and you tell government what to do. But it seems to me that the, the democracy that's happening at the moment is that government is hiding you from the... the, the um, it's stopping... You. Basically, it's saying, we're making decisions and we're barring you from affecting how we make those decisions because we know what's best for you. And it seems to me that in, in order for citizens to become engaged, they need to become critically aware, and that needs to happen at a young age. Now, I don't know how you do that because they're shrinking humanities, and that's the only way people become critically aware so I think it's to have more artists I like it's great to get people colouring and drawing and stuff but if you can somehow get critical awareness across in a fun way that's going to be really uh, powerful I think really really powerful but I mean we've always found like even you know dealing with eight-year-olds and kind of having a conversation about politics is they really do engage and they really yeah. do have things that they want to say and that I think it's it's really important what you said that like once you've actually shown the artifice behind a specific system it creates the space to realize that there's lots of alternative ways of approaching or organizing things again going back to what you're saying about this I suppose ultimately like a kind of market or considered approach doesn't have to be the kind of same old sort of rhetoric or the same old soundbite format but can actually be a much more kind of creative and expansive approach to like how a message is delivered, how a debate is structured or... And working with the art assassins, one of the key things in the early stages of the workshops where we asked them what, what do they want and in the early stages they kind of were considering whether or not what they had to say fitted with the... With, with politics um, and once once you once they got the understanding that you can say whatever you feel you want to say they can then adapt it accordingly and make it work for them well you guys kind of leapt into the next question as well um, but from my experience and from those I talk to um, biggest thing that comes up is we're not educated enough we don't know anything about politics or how to vote or just even the basics. So um, 
how do you think young people are educated about politics now and what should happen to get us more educated about it? Um, I'd like to ask Esma. Esma? Yeah. Esma? Yep. Um, I think going into schools, when I initially go into schools, um, the first question I ask is, do you know why I'm here? No. Okay. We're going to talk about politics today. What do you think when you think of the word politics? And a lot of the time they say things like, oh, it's boring, I don't care about it, or, you know, the Houses of Parliament, like really stereotypical answers. Um, and I think that's the kind of thing that we need to move away from um, and kind of linking to what we just spoke about just now about language and things like that. Like, it's kind of a, like quite exclusive. Like, this whole domain of politics is really exclusive. Like, from the way that people talk, um, the people that are represented in Parliament, like, it's not representative of, you know, even this room. Like, and I think that kind of really needs to, to change. Um, and it's just about kind of making things accessible. And that's why, you know, um, people like myself, um, community engagement officers, go out to schools and we deliver the basics. It's literally called the basics. And we don't sit there, you know, with a whiteboard and say, oh, you know, this is what politics means. Oh, this is what it does. No, we take them through a process where um, it kind of gets, we get them to kind of think for themselves. And that's, that's the really important thing about politics. It's about us making our own decisions. That's what democracy is. It's not somebody else telling us what to do or how to think. Like, we, you know, we're, we're all capable of doing that. And we, we really need to be facilitated in doing that. That's where the education comes in, I believe. Um, and I think a lot of the time, that kind of education is there, that kind of skill um, is being taught, but it's not directed in that kind of way, to be expressed in that kind of way. Um, so, could you just remind me the questions? So I've lost my flow of thought. Uh, basically, what should happen to educate us then? What do you think should be put in place? Like, do you think politics should be compulsory in schools, for example? Um, um, I that think kind of that it should be implemented into the school system. Mm. Um, so I don't think necessarily everybody should be taking GCSE or A-level politics or um, a politics class. Um, but I think it should be implemented into, I don't know, citizenship or a key skill session or whatever session mm. um, exists in that school. Um, and I think it should be in a way that kind of makes it interesting and interactive and not just like oh yeah politics oh the house of parliament let's go on a let's go to to the house of commons like there's way more to politics than going like to a trip to the house of commons which is a good experience but you know it, it's it's not very um it, it doesn't show everything that needs to be shown um, and that's not going to help people make their own decisions and it's not going to help people choose who to vote for or um, why it's important to vote or any, any of those kind of things. Um, so, yeah, and in addition to that, sorry, my last point, <laughs> um, I think also it's really important to stop blaming others. Like, while it's important to say, you know, this should be different and there should be more of this or whatever, um, it's also really important for us to take ownership. Um, you know, everybody here is... Re like fully responsible of themselves and it's really important for us to go out and and find out like we all know what's important to us but find out how our views and our opinions match up with those in power um, and if there isn't anybody you also the option of um, you know, standing yourself never ever like disregard that option because if they can do it, so can everybody in this room and beyond. So, I think we have time for one more response to this question can from I the panel. Shay, too. Shay, because you, yeah. um, you, you got involved in politics quite young. So how did you go about, like, you know, hey, I can run? Um, how did you find out about all that stuff? My family was, my family and friends will say it's because I'm stubborn <laughs> and I don't like being told I can't do something. And that's what happened at school. I got told. Like I just said it, I think I said it was a blasé, blasé statement in school one time, that I'm going to be the first female black prime minister, and my, de my drama teacher, who was also my form teacher, so that was a big problem, um, <laughs> laughed in my face. And I think it just from then, why can't somebody like me engage with politics? And that's where it just, it, it just came from. Um, I think we talked about rhetoric and how we talk about politics, 
and um, and just following on from your point about us taking ownership, we also had to take ownership of the language of how we talk about politics. So when we say politicians are this and that, we then start putting that into a group and cluster as a way of something we can't touch. So we, I think we, as somebody who's on the who is on the inside as well as the outside, I can see from both, point, both, both points of view that we need to be careful about how we talk about it because we end up alienating ourselves. Um, I also think we need to stop giving our amazing teachers so much stuff to do. <laughs> they, they can't do everything. They can't be nurses and give injections and change clothes and give pocket money as well as teach politics. Like, there's, there's real schooling to do there. And I think what councils should be doing is buying in great organisations like Bite the Bullet to do some of that work, which will even free up some of the teachers' time to go and do some market, uh, marking or anything else. So I don't think teachers and schools need to do everything. I think we can outsource a little bit um, to, to, to the best people, to the experts to get in there. Like I remember when Aim Higher was around, they were the best people to come to me and tell me I could go, to, go on to higher education. My food tech teacher telling me that wasn't going to do that for me. So there's the two points I wanted to raise. Um, we're going to take questions from the floor now. Um, anyone have any questions? <laughs> My thing was not really a question, it was more like to kind of agree with what most of you said. So um, I know Dash and Dem and is it Morgan? Yeah. Yeah, you touched a lot on um, representation. And the first thing I thought of when you said that was um, that film that just came out home, starring Rihanna and Jennifer Lopez, and this um, DreamWorks production. And it's about a little black girl and she's surrounded by aliens and stuff. And I just remember it being on Twitter. And a lot of people were just saying like that was really good representation for little black girls because you don't really see them in um, cartoon films as a main character. And I thought it's true because there was a picture with a couple different um, little girls standing next to the cartoon and they were really like smiling and you know really familiarizing themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's the exact same thing with politics. You know, like you said, you don't really see anyone of color in politics and you feel like you're not really being represented. And along those lines, I feel like, yes, there's that as well, but I also don't feel very confident to vote. So kind of taking, you know, the title of this event, Vote of Confidence and changing it around and going, well, I don't feel confident enough to vote at all because I don't really trust most of the um, MPs that make all these promises that they're going to do this and do that, and then in the end, I don't really see much deliverance. I don't remember who exactly it was. I think it was Labour at the time when they made promises to either like improve EMA or keep it going or whatever. And I was a student at the time, so that was very important to me. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. And then it got scrapped, and it was really, really frustrating because obviously when you're a student, you're not working, you don't really have time to do both, or it's kind of a hustle to try and get a job because you have no experience, and everyone knows that's really hard when you haven't got no experience and you're trying to get a job. So, you know, that £30 a week really did help, and then when that went, it was just like, well, what am I supposed to do now? It's, you know, it's hard enough at home, you know, single parent and whatnot. So to me, I think that was my very first experience of really being really annoyed and kind of just having that lack of confidence of wanting to vote because that trust just kind of got scrapped then and there. And I think that was maybe the first and last time I ever voted. It's a dilemma, isn't it? And what, it's almost like sometimes um, you say, you should vote, and then there's the other people saying, you say, oh, who are you going to vote for? I'm going to vote Green. Oh, you should vote for them. You don't know their, all their policies. Like, you can't do a strategic vote. You know, you should vote for this person. It's like, well, what do I do? I've got to read a whole book in order to have an informed opinion so I can shut you up. And then, like, but then again, like, I still don't know from, you know. But I think, I think voting is just one thing that you can do. The other thing is activism. It's like, the reason why policies... I think uh, are still in contention. Let's say student fees. It's because people are still making their voices heard. That's why the Labour government have put through that sort of poultry policy that, hey, if we get voted in, we're going to take it down to six thousand. So then again, someone might say, I don't like Labour, but yeah, I can, I can, I can agitate against six grand. If it goes down to six grand, I can agitate to make that go down more. It seems like there's a there's a room for flexibility with the Labour government that there isn't with the Conservatives. So. I don't know, it's, it's tricky, it's hard because then someone else might say, well, you, you haven't looked at their policy in relationship to healthcare, so you're saying vote for them, but they're going to do this over here. I don't know, some, sometimes you just, 
you don't know what to do. And also, it's important to say you don't have the time. I don't have the time to be involved in activism 24-7. But I think, I don't know, there's got to be a starting point. A policy that directly affects you and that you believe in, are they going to put it through or are they going to put it towards somewhere that you feel is acceptable? Perhaps that's worth voting for that party then. And then if they don't do it, your, your participation in agitation or activist um, activity allows that government to understand that people aren't accepting it. It seems to me that's why policy is still in contention, that when they come forward to get voted in, they'll say, oh, this community didn't like that, so in order for us to, to appease them, to get their vote, we have to have this policy happening. Because you can be sure that the commercial lobbying sector is doing the other thing with millions of pounds to back it up the commercial industry. So the, the way that the, I feel like the general people, general populace get their voices heard is through activism, I guess. Yeah, yeah I completely agree with um, what Morgan said. And I think it comes down to having some kind of self-esteem value in your vote and in your role in democracy. Um, and the point you made about um, the banks and the rich, they, have, they are valued by politicians because they're a core vote, they bring in a lot of funding and a lot of money for X, Y, Z reasons. We need to gather that ourselves as young people and get an identity and some kind of value in our beliefs and project that to them and make them listen. If, they, if, we, if, we, if we don't register to vote, that's another problem, then we have alienated ourselves because it means politicians don't have to come to your door and ask for your vote. And then when you are registered and you don't vote, you're not an active person, so you've not alienated yourself again. We need to start being a, you know, a force to be reckoned with. But if you don't listen to us, there are X and Y, X and X, Y, oh, alphabet. You know what I'm trying to say. Um, uh, and, and we've seen that across the world, um, across the, the world with what's happened recently with, with Baltimore, what's happened recently with, um, with crime, what's happened with the EMA. When, you've met, when you mess with young people, we come out and we need to do that. So I think what the first step is, what do we care about? So I had a discussion with my friend who's over there. Um, what is, I'm, I'm a young adult, so what is my policy group? What do I, I, I don't know if I want to be a homeowner. I'm not really, I'm not a mum, so childcare policies don't really fit with me. Yet yeah, tube, tube fees is a problem for me. That, so what, I, need, I think for me, and going back to your point, I need to find out or us as young people need to come together. What are our four or five key principles? What matter to us that we need to start getting politicians to hear and say, if you don't listen to us, watch in the next five years. A few of you kind of came in on this issue about us taking ownership and responsibility for our own decisions and being active ourselves. But honestly, like, do you know how long that took, a, took me personally, how long it took me to actually own my decisions and be kind of confident in like, okay, I know that I can do something for my life, but that's not something that's easy. Like sometimes you actually have to battle with your own brain to like actually do that. But that goes to my point about, yeah. I said, about self-esteem, and like, it doesn't help as well when, the, when, you, when young people equate problems, drugs, crime, dossing about, yeah. failing GCSEs, whatever it is. We, we don't hear anything great about young people yeah. in the media. So we don't have any self-esteem in ourselves. We don't yeah. ask for something. So I want to ask for my tuition fees to be six grand. And you're gonna yeah. do it? Like we need, yeah. to, we, need to have, we need to have confidence in ourselves yeah. and in what we need as a young adult, whatever spectrum you wanna, however you wanna take it. And demand, if we, if we don't know what we want, how can we ask politicians to give us what we want? We need yeah. to know it yeah. first and that, so. Yeah. But my question was basically in regards to kind of diversity in politics from young people from BME, people from different um, economic statuses, um, whose responsibility is it to be diverse in our kind of government? Is it the kind of idea that, okay, if you don't vote, then it's your fault for not being represented, or is it up to people in leadership to diversify themselves? But Shall I, can I come in here? Yeah, um, so the, the, the system we have at the moment, the political parties have got a crucial role to play in increasing the diversity of our politics so that we have a parliament that may not be a carbon copy of our society, but it, it's a, more like a mirror, that we look at it and we think, oh, there's people like me, whether it's kind of ages, sexuality, whatever the, the, the different aspects of our identity that we have. 
Um, and the reason I say that is that the parties at the moment, we have a party-based system. The parties are the pathways to elected roles. And I completely agree with everything. So politics is all kinds of different things. It's not just the formal party politics. But we live in a country where big decisions are made by the government that affect all of our lives, young and old. So the reason we've been really campaigning for parties to, to open their doors and to bring on a far more diverse group of people into their party is because we're not going to see any changes. And, and I think, it, I don't know about you, but it affects me. If you look at uh, an institution and you're, you're just thinking, I'm not seeing people like me, yep. and wh whatever that means to, to any of us. Now, the problem is when you get to the point where people are putting themselves forward and saying, I'd like to be a candidate, think about me in their local area, it's almost kind of too late by then because so few people are joining political parties now the parties themselves just don't have a talent pool to choose from you know it used to be very common it used to be quite normal to be a member of a political party back in the 50s and the 60s and there were social activities attached to it and you'd probably follow your mum and dad along and voted how they did and now maybe one in a hundred i think it's sort of one percent of the population belongs to a political party so you can kind of see why then the parties don't have that talent pool. i think there's a huge obligation on them now it is people's responsibility as well and I can understand why most people wouldn't want to go into party politics but I just think we've really got to kind of tackle that and that means if somebody does go along um, to a party they should be absolutely welcome with open arms and we know that parties aren't always very good at that kind of basic stuff. Can I quickly... Um, oh. I, I, well I just think that one of the things that's important to remember is just because someone's black doesn't mean they're going to be doing things for you. Yeah. Like that's really really important to stress. Yes. And actually, I, I would say there's poli black politicians operating now who play that card quite a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm black and so I'm going to be yeah, doing what you yeah. want. Two people, Chiku Amuna and Diane Abbott. So like, while Chiku Amuna can be the every man, the young guy, you know, the fresh prince of Labour politics, like in actual fact, he's working in opposition with Cres Cressingham Gardens, which is a council estate in um, mm. Brixton at the moment. He's trying to get them out and get people to displace and put in different parts of the UK while he's sitting on the panels and being this sort of like young yeah. hip politician. Diane Abbott, I've had a personal experience with, and Matt, I don't really want to repeat what happened there, but I just think um, it's really important to go for policy, like, like, um, like you were just saying, it's like find your policy group and fight that way. I don't care who it is who's up there, you yeah. know, black, white, blue, yeah. whatever. It's the policies that's, that's important, not the individual. And I think this, uh, yes, it actually, it's two things, and I think this is the way it always has to happen for black and minority ethnic people. You have to say, yes, I want more representation, but I want so many people that I can, be, I can actually safely criticise you. Yeah. So I don't have to just be like, you're the best because you're black, and I want a black person there yeah. so I can't critique you. So I think at the same time, yeah, yeah, we do need more representation, but at the same time, I'm not just supporting someone because yeah. Yeah. they're black. Don't, you know? want, don't want tokenism. Yeah. But the opposite of what you're saying is what... The opposite <laughs> of what you're saying as well is when... When we diss, um, and I think I may have done it actually, um, so I need to check myself, but um, when we diss the current system, that's, and it, it, the, the majority are elitist, traditional, public schools, but that doesn't mean they are less able to represent you. They just need, it just needs better leadership. So, for example, if I was um, David Cameron, um, thank God I'm not, but and I, and, and I knew that I had a particular intake of people in, the, in, my, in my party and I wanted to put somebody forward to be state, uh, um, Secretary of Education, fine, it's a woman, that's great, and she, she's privately educated, fine. What I would then do is put junior ministers around who are from different areas yeah. and different walks of life, yeah. and I think that's what you need to do. It's not yeah. about the individual being from yeah. Eton yeah. or from a co local comprehensive school mm -hmm. in East London. It is about the policy, and I think we have to be careful about how we just judge somebody by how they look and how, and how we talk about politici politicians as well, because if you... like. I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not taking offence. But the way you guys have spoken about politicians, it will put people off here standing. Then because you've just you've all in a way taken a dig at politicians. So we've got to be really careful about how we're talking about that institution. Well, I think the Thank point you. is that. Oh, some more audience. Okay. oh no! You let's so carry on. And then we we'll ask. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, I think the point is that we want more real people standing, like that's the point. Like we don't want people that we don't, you know, we don't associate with, that, that you know, we don't, that it's kind of like quite exclusive right now, you know?
And that's, I think that's more the point. It's, it's, it shouldn't be like an us and them situation. Yeah. And you know, as long, as far as I see it, personally, if you're an, if you're a leader and you listen, you know, that's yeah. the key skill to yeah. have as a leader. It doesn't matter, you know, whether or not you're educated, where you were educated, where you're from, you know, where you were born. You just need to listen. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, if you're leading, you know, you're representing people, and you should be, you know, wh- whatever area. That's the key skill. But I think parties are listening more and more. I mean, if you look at a current kind of market orientated approach to centralist politics, but policy is a product. It's a product of focus groups, of co creation, of polling, of kind of testing. Like most of the speeches that we've we're kind of hearing have been tested on focus groups to see if anything's going to affect or respond. And obviously, the, if you want to get the most of your money out of your campaign, then you're going to be kind of tailoring your products and your focus to the people that are most likely to vote and listening to the people that have the most numbers. And that's the kind of key issue with young people not voting, is that then they're not having the same attention in this kind of design process of kind of specific policy products being kind of crafted for them. We're going to take two questions. Um, there's one over there and then... Hi. Um, yes, yeah, so I've got... Um, I mean, uh, to one of the things that Morgan said I think was actually uh, really useful, you know, and, I, and, and some of the parallels that he kind of draws with the art world. And, and I, the, you know, one is about analysis, actually, and criticality, which is essential because it is so complex, politics and art, actually. Um, but it's also the difference between the concrete and the abstract, you know, and that so much of the time politics is spoken about in the abstract. So for a young person thinking about getting into politics, it's like you've got to get into politics because of X, Y, and Z. So I think, okay, so, and, th- and it's all very abstract. It's never, you know, concrete things that they can grasp hold of. And I know that people, you know, young people have opinions and they have things that they want to say and all the rest of it, but a lot of the time, the kind of the abstracts and the concrete never kind of seem to coalesce together and form into something that they feel that they can actually engage with. Um, I mean, and to bring it into the concrete, I would give an example of Peckham. You know, I was born in Peckham, just there, when it used to be a hospital. Um, But, you know, in the 1970s, late 1970s, um, Peckham, or Southwark, had a very old Labour council that had been around, you know, since the 60s, the Labour old guard, you know, all those guys. Um, And they, very male, very white, and they... um, were in, po- in the pocket of the London Docklands Development Corporation. So they were doing all sorts of deals to, you know, sort out their mates and sort themselves out and all the rest of it. And it culminated in um, uh, them deciding that they were going to sem- spend £70 million building a new town hall and um, a dual carriageway right through Peckham. So they were going to knock down all, all, you know, they knocked down. So what we know is Peckham Road, Peckham High Street now. All that was going to go, there was going to be a big underpass, it was kind of going to look sort of something like wood green or something, it was going to be completely destroyed. And what happened is that uh, a group of local people from all kind of class strata actually, so people from up the top of Camborough Grove, all the way pe- from pe- people like you know, my mum and, and, you know, and, and people from you know, w- w- where I was living, on the, where we were living on the Sumner Estate and all that lot, Everybody came together and formed a campaign group. Um, and what was, uh, what was powerful about the pan- campaign group is that it did bring together people from all types of backgrounds, so public school educated all the way through to just ordinary working class people. And it was effective, you know? And what actually happened in the end of it is that they, they won the campaign, the town hall wasn't built, but then a lot of those people who were campaigning, and again, from all types of kind of class social background then stood as councillors okay for the Labour Party um, and they were elected you know so what we so what that shows and I think you know I'm what that shows is that process if you engage because I think it is about kind of goes back to localism you know and and operating locally being involved but how you can kind of make that transition from activism through to something effective, you know? And I think that's, you know, because at the moment we have that, we have that situation where you have kind of two camps. Either you're an activist or you're a politician. And actually, you know, I mean, I think the Green Party do that quite well, you know, not, um, you know, I mean, they've got their faults, but, um, but I mean, 
you know, but it's that, that idea where you can bring together um, this idea of being a, an, an activist, wanting kind of change locally, and actually affecting that change. And I think, you know, coming through local councils, like Esme has done, is... Esme? Esme? Shay. 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 Esme. Oh, sorry, I've got you mixed up. No worries. Shay, okay. Um, you know, I, I think that's, that, for me, feels like the right kind of path, because, you know, I mean, you know, again, I remember when Harriet Harman was elected here, you know, and my mum was her press secretary, right? Um, but we, so, we, so we've kind of, but I've seen the, the path that Harriet's taken. We're going to have to hurry you because um, the... No, I, I, okay, so, 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 so the last point that I want to make <laughs> is that it's just, in, and again, it's in terms of the abstract, of what, how people feel about politics, right? Because, you know, someone like Harriet, you know, is an MP, and people think locally, like, well, how can I make, how can I make a difference? How can, you know, how can I affect what Harriet thinks? Actually, you know, as a group of young people, 30 of you can get together and say, we want to meet you, yeah. right? We want to come to your surgery and, you know, so there's, so there, there is, there's ways of kind of engaging with the process and doing it. Mm. And there is, and there, there's actually practical examples where I think it has kind of made a difference, you know? Okay. And there's one question. I think if I just make a point, for me it's about like when and where you can do politics. So obviously there's a lot of debate at the moment we're here now because the general election is coming up, but then the next one will be in another five years. So what happens in that five year gap really? And I know a lot of people talk about activism and again, sometimes we don't want to put, put in an activism camp because it's not necessarily like a big campaign that you want to be part of, it's just a point that you have. And I think when it comes to young people, I'm going to talk about my experience obviously, you can only do that. I feel like there's almost an added difficulty when you talk about doing it at the local level because to some extent young people are displaced and I'll explain this in that you might move to go to university so all of a sudden what is your local area what is the politics of your local area how does what you need fit into that local bit is it actually back at home that you need to be doing it or is it in your university area I know when my brother went to university this is like what 10 years ago he went everyone he knew lived between like Elephant and Castle and London Bridge, and now is working, I'm going to call them young, working young people, <laughs> I don't know what young people categorise, like what their age goes up to as well, they're displaced, they're no longer in one section, a lot of them have had to go back home, wherever that may be, that may be in Kent, that may be outside of North London, it's kind of a bit of a, a mess about where, what I'm trying to say is a bit of a mess about where and how you can get involved, if it's, I mean yes, there is the local, there is the local issue, which I think a lot of people still are not aware of. I don't think a lot of people are aware that, I mean, I know I wasn't, and I am now because of my friend. I have an issue, I'm going to see my local counsellor. It's not, I'm 24, and I'd like to say I'm an educated person, and that's not something I was aware of until I was 23. And that's what, any day-to-day -day issue, but even then a bigger thing, for example, my bigger thing is always, I'm always complaining about the cost of transport. I'm going to move in September outside of the area that I live in, so who is the person that I that I talk to and I go to about that. Who are the people that I draw on? I can't necessarily draw together a group of 30 young people because I'm no longer gonna be in the same area as those 30 young people. So I think it's kind of, how do we find ways where we can be heard all the time, not just up to the election point, where those places you can be heard are so that we know how to have our voice heard when we actually, when we find it. I know, like, originally before we were talking about, you know, what is it that you want? Once you've found it is what it is that you want, what, at what point and where do you get to have your voice heard? Because I know that the first time I voted, I was like, yeah, I'm going to get my voice heard on tuition fees, yeah, this is my moment. Obviously didn't get heard because it all went awry. And then you're like, okay, apart from, like, freeze the fees things and stuff like that, there's, what other points do you have as an individual? I feel like, yeah, you have power as a group, but I think people always want to know what power you have as an individual, where that is going to be, and if you always have to mass, on mass, at a specific time, at a specific place, you lose kind of the value of what politics is, which is supposed to be like an everyday thing, your everyday struggles being home. So, so um, <coughs> does anyone on the panel have anything to say about that? Um, I'll just give you a really minor example. Um, so, I, I'm based in Bedford, um, and I'm from Bedford, born and bred. I went to uni outside of Bedford, um, but apart from that, mostly Bedford girl. Um, and my remit recently extended for work, um, 
and I know it's different when it when it's work and when it's personal but I really do care about what I do like this is a real passion for me um so okay I thought okay so where should I target and I knew that the other place quite close to Bedford that is in need of young people like youth engagement in democracy is Luton which is quite close to me but I don't really know much about Luton so I just thought okay find out about who's representing them or who's standing for them and then also like the different um, places that you might find young people um, like organisations or whatever and, and you can literally just contact them I think also Twitter is quite a, like and I'm saying this in a completely non patronising way but um, it's always really good like when you just send out a tweet and then people like miraculously seem to um, almost immediately reply to your tweets um, especially like if you show like a real like interest and passion in what you're seeking um, but yeah I do think I do think it is just um kind of constant seeking, which can be a bit draining, um, but but yeah, I, I'd say I'd say that is part of it. Um, and then the other thing, okay, I've forgotten, so I'll just let somebody else say, sorry. Um, Morgan talked about how politics is based on a very old, middle-class, white um, tradition. And so I guess some tips I would say is how to be middle-class. Um, because I remember what I spoke before, um, I have two very different groups that I represent, the African Caribbean community and the affluent wanting yoga and yummy mummy classes. So how do I appease both? And actually, they come to me a lot because they know how to use the system. So they all, when, they, when they move in, and I'm, we've got a really high turnaround um, for people coming in, they want to meet their counsellors. So I urge each and every one of you, meet your counsellor go to their surgery, let them know you, you know them, make, make, do eye contact. Um, I would email them, just hi, happy new year, just let, be, be on their radar. I would also meet with your um, MP, um, I would follow them on Twitter, Facebook page, I'd get the local, the local um, or for us we've got the new recorder, just get local news, go to different local groups as well, um, because like, we've got the Forest Gate, Forest Gate WI, so the Women's Institute, which is a, a really active, great community group that are not political. So that I would just, I would, you, you said seek, these are my, my few little tips, talk, your counsellors will, are probably the best connected person locally for you who can match you up. I'm always doing email introductions, when someone wants funding here and wants something to do there, I'm always, I'm also trying to connect these two very different community groups as well. So your counsellor's the best stakeholder person to talk to, to help you map where, what's going on, and hopefully that will then open doors for you. So that, that's my three tips there. Thank you, that's really useful. Um, Last question. You say you? Oh, you got mic. Yeah, so I think you've touched on it a bit, but um, for me, I think uh, young people have been like painted quite negatively by politicians, um, or they've been courted, but then the policy hasn't reflected the sort of promises. I think David Cameron the other night on his debate was talking about um, you won't be able to sign on within a certain amount of time for finishing university. Um, which anyway is kind of, again, it's a problem with the term young people, that that's implying all young people are students or they have supportive families or things like that. So I suppose my question is about how can, so I suppose if you didn't want to sort of go in, in that direction, become an MP, then you've talked about activism, but that again is painted quite negatively as well. So I suppose I was wondering, is the strategies young people can adopt to kind of circumvent that and also if you're pointing them towards a different kind of activism, what, what's the future of that? Is it always going to be a minority, or is the point that those kind of Occupy and Anonymous have MPs, or, or is it always a kind of losing battle, but well, you're protesting? Yeah, I think the thing is, is p people talk about activism, they have quite a stereotypical view of what that <laughs> is. It's like someone in a balaclava smashing a window somewhere. But in actual fact, like one of the things that's been happening over the past year is that a lot of um, ordinary citizens have been politically empowered through activist struggles. Or we can call it a different term, just through um, uh, being in opposition to power or in opposition to the dominant view that's trying to put forward a program or a policy that's going to disenfranchise them. So we can talk about that in relation to what's happening in housing in London. 
there's a, a group called the Focus E15 Mums, and what's what's happened, what's really exciting about watching those things happen, is that normal people become these amazing political firebrands, people who can speak publicly. There's no nerves, there's no how do I do it, they just do it. It also happened in, in the uh, Occupy uh, movements that were happening around the universities in London. Uh, I went to visit one in, in um, University of Arts London. And there were some students there that blew my mind. They were just so articulate and so passionate and so strong. And it's because the system doesn't allow you to become that person. If you go to, I've got nothing against private school, right, on principle, but they, uh, they tailor you to be able to rise to that occasion. You're made to do that. You have lessons on rhetoric. You have lessons on debating. Yeah. In normal schools, like let's say schools you don't pay, you're just told to be quiet, if you show any leadership skills, you're taught to be, you know, you, you're just, you're, you're made to feel awkward in some ways. And that also happens in your peer group. If, you, if you're an intelligent person, you're at secondary school, one of the worst things you can do is talk about how much you like reading books. So it's like, <laughs> but, but the, what, what happens is these situations that get foisted on people birth this like latent leadership qualities that they have. So I think well, that's one of the things that's quite exciting about activism in, in that spectrum. I'm not talking like, is, is somehow connecting ordinary citizens with other ordinary citizens saying this could be you, it's not like a, 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 a world away. And I think the way you sustain it as well is, is also that thing of asking questions and saying, why do we actually have democracy? Is it the best? Is it the best model? Why, why do we all work underneath this, this thing? I'm not saying let's dismantle it completely, but why isn't it open to question? Why do we pay taxes? What, what exactly are they doing? So I think it's just that critical awareness again is, is really essential and important. So critical awareness, giving people the space to um, become who that they, they can be. And um, yeah, again, I just think it's about using the tools that are available. It's not just like, oh, democracy has to be the one thing or activism's the other thing, or you have to work in a group. Be a personally responsible citizen. The way you treat people should be decent, that's where politics begins, right? Like, um, and then, you know, I don't know, it's, it's about a kind of modular approach to your, your participation in civic life, I guess. If that, does that make? Yeah, I think, yeah. <laughs> I think that's a good answer, because like speaking to young people, I think, and, and this year in Roberta, I think we've had conversations, and, and they were talking about that actually, like, the system doesn't really reflect how young people live their lives. And I, I, like one example, we were talking about home ownership and we were like, actually maybe like Airbnbs are much more like relevant to, than to being able to afford a home. So actually talk about building new homes isn't necessarily relevant for young people. So this kind of modular approach to, you have lots of different ways for different issues. I think so, yeah, a good starting point. Does anyone have any final thoughts from the audience panel? I just build on that. Quickly, yeah. just, but I think what we're talking about now is how you develop your democratic muscle and my vision is that everybody has the opportunity to do that and nobody is kind of talked down and um, what I think we've picked up on is that what gets people political or being democratic participants is something that they care about and it's about what matters to them and I think that for me is the common theme and you've just given some brilliant examples and that is what gets people into it. And they get the taste for having changed something and challenged power. And then you can really, really build on that. And we saw that that's just happened in Scotland. And I saw some great research which showed it's the 18 and the 19-year-olds who got involved in formal voting in a referendum. But there was loads of other stuff around it. And they are now putting themselves forward. They've, they've had a chance to develop mm -hmm. some skills, some knowledge, some democratic muscle. And they're not going to let go of it. And I think that's what we've got to do for everybody. And actually, sorry, um, Often, young people are painted as being disinterested in party politics, and I think that's a really important distinction to be made um, because they're in, like, they're super interested in political issues. Yeah. If you look on, you know, loads of social media feeds, um, you can see how engaged they are, um, and it's so important to kind of recognise that instead of kind of. I think it's just important to dispel that myth, really. So. I think what's hard for a lot of young people as well is if you look at a lot of successful activists throughout history, 
I mentioned Gandhi and salt earlier, and again, it goes back to what you're saying. It's like finding something that everyone's going to care about and kind of connect to you. Or Harvey Milk with dog poo, like he kept going and going, and then it was only when he kind of realised what's something that everyone else is going to care about that I can fight and achieve that then people backed him and he is really successful. So, again, it's also difficult for young people to help to kind of find the strategy of what's going to make the kind of broader populace care about the issues that are important to them as well which is all about kind of also an advertising approach to psychology. When we were doing Bedford Voices and we were talking to the ad agency, the first thing that they're kind of thinking is what's going to make someone else connect to someone's issue. And yeah, I mean, that's quite a difficult thing to address, but. Okay, um, we're coming to the end of what's been a wonderful session. Um, could we just take final comments from each of the panelists and could you answer the question um, while you're summing up? If you were a young person today, would you vote in the elections? Yes or no, and why? <laughs> or who? Um, can we start with Rowan? Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know if I, like, if I would vote, actually, uh, um, in, in that very uh, formal way. I um, probably would. Uh, being a teenager, probably by that point, be very uh, geared towards social media and being able to exploit that. And um, if I had issues that weren't represented, probably follow a route which um, picks up a momentum within that. And um, the reason why I say that probably is because um, Politics should be uh, a work in progress. And uh, through these um, very arbitrary or unconventional ways of approaching politics comes the new way of doing things. And I think that what we shouldn't forget is how the youth should be that um, important cluster of young people who should not worry so much about how it's done now as well, but think and stretch ideas in a different way, because that's really important. Thank you. Dash? Would I vote if I was a teenager now, 18? Um, probably not, in all honesty, no. But in hindsight now, yes, definitely. Kind of seeing critically the significance of voting and what that means for a whole group of people to be kind of left out of kind of key decision making process but um, thinking back to kind of my mindset then then I don't know if I really would be able to kind of make a decision Morgan? I, I don't know because I think uh, I don't know it's a very different climate at the moment but in some, in some ways it's a lot worse like socially, economically, politically today than it was when I was like 18. Um, it was new labour, things could only get better, you know, things were kicking off. Um, but I think, and, but also there was a counterculture. Now, the new labour were doing a good job of getting rid of that. <laughs> but um, sometimes when I look around popular culture, I wonder how somebody is going to become politically active because they're bombarded with images of people just talking about the accumulation of wealth, entrepreneurialism, no, no, no idea of Creative critical engagement. Industries. Yeah, so, like, I wonder, I wonder how you would battle against that onslaught of people telling you not to actually think and how you would then become an active citizen. But then again, I grew up on an estate in Clapham, and Clapham is one of those areas that just got gentrified while everybody was looking the other way. Like, <laughs> like it is so much so that if I say I'm from Clapham, people say, oh, you must be posh. And then you sort of think, well, they just totally reclassified the area I grew up in. Um, so if I was still living on that estate and, the, and our house was under threat of compulsory purchase and we were going to be moved from where we were living to Milton Keynes or Hastings, then absolutely I'd be activated and I'd be, I'd be voting. But if that wasn't happening and um, I was just, you know, on social media or just worried about, like, um, because actually it's quite difficult being 18. You don't really know who you are. You don't know if you're beautiful or not. You know, there's a lot of people to see. <laughs> Especially if you're black and minority ethnic, because there's a lot of things out there telling you that you're not good enough, that you're not going to succeed, that you're ugly and this and that. You should be trying to be something else. So I think it's really, really difficult if you start from a back foot anyway 
got to figure out who you are and know that you're proud and beautiful and you can do stuff. So I don't know, there's a lot in the way of people voting, but um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'd like to think I would. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope I'd vote. I don't think I'd be much of a model uh, director of the Electoral Reform Society if I was out there talking about how to make my system <laughs> better than I was going to vote myself, so I'm sure I would. But... In, in, in the knowledge or with hindsight that actually my vote wouldn't stand a very good chance of, of counting. We've got a very, very old-fashioned voting system. Most of us here will live in a seat where it's a bit of a foregone conclusion. And that's not our fault. That's, that's, that's the system. And I think that's a real sort of sadness and a feeling that people have now. So it, it, at the same time, it is both incredibly important to vote. If younger people don't vote, they will carry on having the things they care about completely ignored by politicians because it has become a kind of retail shopping mm. exercise in that sense. So it's incredibly important, but also to be, to be kind of thinking about, is there a different way we could do this? Um, I guess... Should young people, is it, is it should young? Oh, would I vote? Sorry, I've got like a really bad memory, as you can tell. Um, would I vote um, if I were a young person? Um, yes, but honestly, it would be quite a tokenistic vote um, in the same way that it was when I first voted, um, when I was 18. Um, and I think that's not cool. That's the thing that needs to change. Um, it, yeah, it's great to be engaged in politics, but it's also really important to understand it and understand why it's important to you and how it matches up to you as an individual. I mean, I think that's the thing that we often forget, that we overlook the kind of individual, personal politics. So, um, yeah. Um, so, to sum up, um, I would say meet with your local representative, just one of them, and ask them what have they done around young people. Have they met with a youth group in the last six months? Have they opened a school building? Anything. What have they done to, to, uh, to engage with somebody that's, that's younger than them? Ask them that question. I think we also should start a hashtag ageism because we have a everyday sexism, everyday racism, but we don't have anything around everyday ageism against young people. So if we start mobilising and nipping up those um, microaggression rhetorics against young people, we will start having our, our own confidence and identity in ourselves as young adults. So somebody start that hashtag. Um, <laughs> I would say find out task you all with finding out one issue that's really important to you. I think your B&B thing is a really good idea because I don't think I want to own a home. I struggle to I struggle to find where I parked my car. I asked my friend, we walked to the wrong car and I clicked, I clicked it and then, oh, the car was behind me. So I don't think I'm ready to own a home because I'll probably forget where I put the keys. So I, I think, yeah, we all should need to go away and find out what's the one issue that matters to me and let's start making some connections. Let's start changing our language with how we talk about politics and politicians, because as somebody who's a politician, when you say there's no representative, hello, I'm a Nigerian young woman here, I'm trying to be diverse, so let's, let, there are people up, uh, coming up, so let's start talking positively about it. And my last thing is stay young. The problem is when you become a politician or you become an activist or you become anything, you end up, like, it's like the theory of osmosis, you end up being the thing that you were trying to turn against. So I pierced my ears. I said, I'm going to stay young because I end up dressing old and wearing loads of heels and wearing really bo boring colours. And no offence to old people who wear boring colours, but you just, you just you forget yourself. So that's my one thing I'll say. Stay young, have pink hair, have pierce your nose, wear glittery eyeshadow, stay young and stay true to yourself. So that's my thing. There's a, there's a, I think it's called Unlock Democracy, another great organisation. Um, I think they've got something called Vote Match, and you put in the things you care about, the policies you care oh, about, great. and it'll spit yeah. out some it advice works. on the parties that are doing stuff for you. It's really, it it's really, really good. I think it, I'm going to look it up for you now. I think it's called Vote Match. And don't vote much. And, and don't forget everything that we've just said. It's not about that ballot paper. So don't forget, even if you vote for somebody, and you can hold them to account. You can email them. You can go to their surgery. And you can ask for them. You can write a letter. You can ask them to make a speech or a motion about what you want. There are the, and I'm happy to have this discussion afterwards. It's it's not just about the seventh of May, even though it's really important. But there are other things that we can do. There we go. Find your political match. Vote match. Okay. The, One yeah. more question oh. at the back. Could I, could I just respond to, oh, yeah. to her quickly? Um, <laughs> like, um, I'm, not I'm, not necessar I'm not necessarily an activist uh, at all. Um, my partner is. Um, but we've also been annoyed at 
travel fairs. And one of the things I think is, why isn't anyone organising a boycott? Because, to be honest, no one's gonna, you're not going to be put in prison for not going on the train. But that's going to cost them a significant amount of yeah, revenue. If you it. say, for one day, we're not going to go on transport, that's yeah, it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they will listen to us then. So, I, I, I mean, whoever has <laughs> organised <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah, give me your name, I'm going to organise it. But sometimes I think um, that sort of activity, yeah, it would have a massive effect. And they couldn't ignore it. Yeah. And I think there's ways we could all just be like, I'm not going to take the bus. Or yeah. I'm not going yeah, yeah, so to start here. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just wanted to slightly challenge Katie. Just cause, mm-hmm. so you've you've suggested a vote vote match, which I presume is like a part vote for the party that you're most interested in. It's just something to I think. That's yeah, what I, that's what I, I think it's I've, a device to help people yeah. think through which party to vote for. Yeah. yeah, and I think your proposition, if you like, is that people would vote for parties rather than vote for individuals. Mm-hmm. And I f- no. Sorry, Shannon, I'm not at all. My, the, the change right. I'm advocating is something called the single transferable vote that right. they use in local Scottish elections, where you just number, you put your top favourite, you can vote for candidates as well as parties. Under the current system, we're not free to be able to do that. So I would completely support a change to a system where you could vote for a person as much as for a party. Mm. We don't have that at the moment. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, I'm not sure if I totally agree with that either, but. Um, <laughs> So you talked about your local MP, yeah. and then there's also this question of the political party they're part of, and I think that's like an important kind of thing you're thinking about, really. It's like there's the individual representing you, and then there's the political party. And I just sort of wondered if you had any thoughts, as the only member, explicit member of a political party, and also a representative, a Shea, yeah? In, in that kind of dialogue between you as an individual mm. and then you as a member of a party. If I wanted to go any further, I don't know how far I could get with being on the balance of being being loyal to my party yeah. and the leadership as well as my, my, my principles. But I guess I'm going to take my own advice and stay true to myself. So you so if, if your personal beliefs yeah. weren't in, a, in accord with your party leader, which is, what's your party, sorry? Am I allowed to say? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's yeah, la- yeah, yeah, Labour. Yeah, um, so if they weren't in accord with the party leader, then you, you would consider mm-hmm. not being affiliated with that party? Yeah, yeah. I think there are so many people that I know that left the party and left being a councillor, so they, they um, kind of renounced their, their uh, affiliation uh, mm-hmm. to Labour group when the Iraq war happened. And I think if something like that happened and it really pained me, I would really like to believe and my friends would probably make me do it as well, but I would <laughs> abdicate away from that because it's, it's my name that's at that part, mm. towards that part. Yes, the party and it being a really safe Labour seat helped me get there, but at the end of the day, it's, it's what's going to be left under my legacy and my name and my footprint on earth. So I hope I would say true to myself. Make sure I do it. Hold me accountable. Mark Reckless, who's a UK, right? Oh. My, my, now my initial response to that could be my initial response to that could be oh my god I can't do anything I'm completely screwed what can I do actually I'm going to vote Labour because I'm just going to vote Labour and I'm going to stand for what I believe in but what it means is that when anything comes any bit of literature comes through my letterbox from Mark Reckless I'm going through it with a fine tooth comb looking at the promises that he's making and if anything in it I mean there's some stuff about like you know protecting local wildlife and things like that and resisting against the airport you know for whatever is political persuasion, a couple of things that he's done, I might actually agree with. So, and, but there's also things that he says he's not going to do. So I'm going to make sure, even though I can't stand him, and I saw him on the train the other day, and I really <laughs> wanted to say something to him, <laughs> but, um, but that I'll bring him to account. Do you see what I mean? And that's really, really important that we actually, we should all feel that, you know, you can do it. So that's the same for Simon Hughes. He's been around for a long time, so pull him up. That was a wonderful point to end on. Um, thank you to all our wonderful panellists for certainly giving me a lot to think about. Thank you to Laura and Scott and everyone who's helped out today. And this concludes the show. Thanks to the audience. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>